If you've ever wondered what it takes to really ensure that your guests feel seen and heard and, and cared for during your events, then I have got something special for you today. Uh, coming to you from Down Under in Australia, I think you're absolutely gonna love what Jurgen has to share on the topic of transformation in memorable experiences. Inquiring minds wanna know, how are entrepreneurs like us daring bravely to build a stage, ditch the sweatpants, and step up to the mic? How do we create our own transformative events so we can get our message out into the world in a bigger way that's not only profitable, but it's actually something we can be proud of? That's the question, and the answers are inside this podcast. My name is Sarah Faefer. Welcome to Green Room Central. Hey, it's Sarah. I have an invitation for you right now. You can join entrepreneurs from across the globe who share a passion for hosting their own events. Become part of the community that inspires and cheers you on over at greenroomcentral.com. Today, I brought into Green Room Central Studios Dr. Jurgen Strauss, founder and chief innovator at InnovaBiz, and a mentor for podcasters all around the world. He hosts boutique events locally in Australia and in some exotic tropical locations around the world. His events are dedicated to a common purpose, working with businesses to affect transformation. Jurgen, welcome to Green Room Central Studios. Say hello to Lynchpin Nation. Hi, Lynchpin Nation, and thanks for having me on the show, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you being here uh, all the way from Australia. Uh, and first, I want to get into what type of events you host and just have you describe them in a little more detail than I just gave folks in the intro, if you would. Yeah. Well, the big events that, that we've been hosting that I've talked to you about are a boutique retreat. And what we do is take up to 15 business owners and businesses out of their business, away from their business, preferably in a location that has them out of contact with the business, which is quite a challenge for a lot of businesses. And we also want to have them come into a pampered environment, so really take care of themselves first and put themselves into a mindset of relaxation, of really high focus on then planning for the next year for their business, their vision, their mission, um, looking at long-term plans, and then really digging down into a detailed one-year plan that we then review quarterly with them. We do that in a way that we use a lot of NLP techniques where there's accelerated learning involved, there's digging into values, there's alignment of values, removal of limiting beliefs, a lot of those things that go on, as well as the nitty gritty work of the planning that happens. And, and the events that we've run so far have just been transformational. And for me, it's always been an inspiration, not only do I, to see the other businesses transform and come away from that event with a new sense of purpose and vigor and excitement about their business, but it also rubs off on me. I often learn things that I can then implement in my business. We also work on our own business as well. So it's we get in front of the room when it's our turn to present our vision and our mission and the participants get to challenge that as well. So we're sort of in the trenches with all the participants there. So it's a circle, if you will. Everyone's kind of learning is, from yeah. each other. Uh, I love yeah. that. I love that you're you're taking them out of their everyday lives in order to do uh, this super important work of that long-term planning, which I think is typically really challenging to do when you've got the distractions of running a business yeah. kind of at the forefront. Yeah. And so you were saying that you create an environment that's really conducive to them kind of turning off their their real life, if you will, the distractions and really getting focused, what are some of the things that you do? Well, the first thing we like to do is go into a warm tropical location 
because we were talking before the show recording, we're, we're actually having a spell of tropical weather here in Melbourne at the moment, but in the middle of winter, our winter, which is June, and that's typically when we run these businesses, it's cold, wet and miserable. And so what we like to do is take people out of that cold, wet and miserable environment that can be a bit depressing and take them to a tropical location. Now, we've been to places like Coconut Island in Thailand. We've been to uh, Vanuatu. We've been to Fiji. And we go to resorts that are that cater for all of our needs. So obviously we require good meeting rooms, good breakout rooms, good business facilities that we can do the work that we do, but at the same time also catering for the fun side of things. So having a really nice room, having um, really good food, really good service, being taken care of in that environment. So there's nothing people have to worry about we we kind of package everything up people don't have to worry about anything we organize the travel the flights the the transfers from the airport to the resort and back there's nothing the participants have to worry about other than bringing a good mindset and bringing their energy into that planning and that um, that work that we do then in the environment then some of the things, some of the smaller things that we focus on that we really value highly because I think they contribute a lot to the success of this is the environment of the actual working location. So if we have a room that we work in, it's got to be natural light. It's got to be really well lit. It's got to be a comfortable temperature. There's got to be water available for the participants to keep hydrated because a lot of the work we do is actually very tiring mentally and that requires you to be hydrated so that you can function at your best. We also um, have setups to video people when they do their presentations so that they can have a record of what they've presented and take that away with them. We set up the rooms in a way that we can run the Disney creativity strategy. So we typically set our agenda up that in the morning we have the kind of the dreaming room session. So we look at the visioning and the plan, or the visioning and the dreaming about the plans and imagining what might be. Then in the mid morning session, we typically go into the sweat room where we do the work to put the meat on the, on the bones of that. And then in the afternoon session, we go into the reality room where we kind of challenge that. We say, well, yeah, that, that's a really good plan, but do you have the resources to achieve that within that time frame? What if this goes wrong? What if the environment changes here? And then start to build contingency plans around that and the next morning we go back into the dreaming room so we keep doing those cycles so i want to get this straight jurgen you contract for three separate spaces to be using and cycling through uh, we have had three separate rooms we have also had a large room where we've taken areas and we've just said you know now we move over into this section so physically the participants know because we're physically moving into this area, it's kind of, that's the session we're working in. So there's actually a trigger. It's not just us saying, okay, we're gonna switch our work style or we're going to switch our mindset to dreaming or to um, sweat room to working conditions or to, to um, reality checking. There's actually a physical trigger as well because we either go to another room or to another space within a larger room. I absolutely love that. I was just learning uh, a couple of weeks ago about this concept of of different colors of hats in, in mm. I don't remember what the title is, but like green hat is like creativity yeah. and imagination That's and, you know. De Bono's six sinking hats. There, there you go. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I was loving that, that description of like having these times when, okay, if I have 
And so you're doing it with physical spaces where when we're mm. here, this is where, you know, like nothing's off the table, get all the ideas out, be creative, be imaginative, like stretch the bounds of what's possible. And then, but you have different spaces where like you call it a reality space where, yeah. uh, okay, now we have to really challenge what's there and decide if it's, you know, figure out what's possible. And uh, I absolutely love that you're using physical triggers, whether in the same room, moving them or different rooms to help get people into the right mindset, set the help, help you set expectations for the work that needs to be done mm. during that time. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, I, so I'm hearing that you're caring for a lot of the pieces of their environment, like you're handling their travel expenses and probably their meals and yep. uh, things like that. So they really can just show up and <laughs> and do the work. And so you're removing a lot of the the barriers to to saying yes. Is that do you find that helps in your marketing? Yes, it does help in the marketing. I mean, what it does do, of course, is it makes it a much more high ticket item. So if we were to just sell the cost of the event itself, there'll be considerably lower cost. But some people prefer to know that if I attend this, this is my overall investment rather than this is the the investment I have to make for the ticket to the event. And then I've got to worry about my accommodation and then I've got to book my flights. So there's, yeah, there's, it's a lot easier. We've, we're taking away the friction at the moment. So um, here's the total investment for that event. And if you say yes, then we go we just take care of everything for you it's frictionless there i love that style of mm. of event planning it's really my personal favorite uh to do it that way um and of course p um part of the attraction as well is we've we've chosen a really good location geographically in terms of where we're going which country which location as well as the facility that we're going to. So that helps us in our marketing and we can use the marketing collateral of the resort we're going to, for example, and say, well, this is where you're staying. So that, of course, gets people into a, a very um, nice emotional state because they're getting excited. Wow, that looks really nice. That resort looks nice. The pool looks nice. The gym looks nice. The rooms look nice. The food looks nice. Yeah, oh, that that's brilliant to use the marketing materials that already exist, that the hotel has <laughs> and the mm. resort has spent lots and lots of money and attention and care into putting together and to be able to use that uh, yeah. in your marketing. And of course, the, yeah. other, the other thing that comes into that is that we can negotiate a package with the resort and also we can negotiate group travel uh, arrangements with the number of people that we're booking for at once. Whereas if everybody did it for themselves, they'd be paying whatever the full price is typically. Yeah. I want to circle back to uh, the, and talk a little bit more about the frameworks that you're using, because you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned NLP, you mentioned Disney creativity. Uh, what are all the models that you're using? Why are you using them? Like, how did that, I know it's a big question, but how yeah. did it come to be that, uh, that you became aware of these different models that you can integrate into the events that you, that you run? Well, it comes back. So we do these events as a joint partnership with my business and my business coach's business. My business coach has a training business that her primary uh, work is training people in NLP. So I did some NLP training with her um, to a very advanced level and started helping run some of those training programs with her. And as we were doing that, we, we were sharing our vision of what else we'd like to do with our business. And one of the things that intersected in our visions was the idea of traveling around and going to fa fabulous places to work. And so we came up with this idea, well, let's take this concept of the training and expand it to 
try to actually a planning exercise and take people to these places and travel for work. <laughs> That's such a good idea. I, yeah. I'm a huge, uh, huge uh, travel um, fan and uh, it, it has been on my mind as well to uh, start a mastermind where I can be bringing people to all the locations that I have on my <laughs> list of, yeah. of uh, places I want to go. And it sounds like you're, uh, you've been doing that for quite some time. It's, it's got to be fun to be able to live out some of your, uh, your travel dreams while also helping to, to impact uh, these mm. businesses so profoundly at the same time. Yeah, it is fun. And uh, the whole like organizing it, I mean, there are a lot of challenges in organizing this and it's a lot harder than organizing a family vacation because it's a lot of different moving pieces that have to have to be managed. Uh, but it is really fun in the lead up phase, in the planning and the anticipation. And then, of course, when we arrive at the resort and we get together on the first evening just as a a group to have a casual dinner and that's the what we do there is primarily make sure everybody knows one another and starts to feel comfortable with one another so we ensure that everybody feels they're part of this tribe they're part of this group this is a safe space everybody's here to support one another and then the next morning when we get started and kick off usually everybody's quite comfortable in starting to share some fairly um personal things you know they may be personal personal they may be about the business but they're comfortable sharing for example what kind of revenue they've got right now and what their dreams are for revenue in the future and how they and then we start to work obviously on how they will get there so uh it sounds like fostering community within these events is something that you're really intentional about. Is there something that yeah. a specific tactic that you you use that it seems to work pretty well, maybe on that first night? It's yeah, we have we start off with getting everybody to introduce themselves. And then there's a lot of NLP techniques that that we use that uh, I'm not even conscious of all the ones I'm doing. A lot of these are unconscious. A lot of it is getting people to have deeper conversations and asking some really good questions to move beyond the, hi, I'm Jürgen and my business is in Overbiz and here's what we do and here's my website, go and check it out. So that's typically what happens when you first meet somebody. Uh, we kind of quickly get beyond that and say, okay, well, where do you want to where do you see your business or obviously because we're in in this unique environment then there's a lot of things that we can talk about in the past most of our participants have come from near melbourne and so we've organized to travel together as a group so we're already building that community feel in the aircraft or in the group and on one occasion we um we our flight got delayed that was i think it was vanuatu because there was a, a tropical storm in vanuatu and they couldn't land or take off whatever the, the flight was delayed for about five hours so we were hanging around the airport on a connecting flight in sydney for five hours and we used that time obviously everybody was frustrated because it's kind of dead time but we actually used that time to foster that sense of community and of course it was a shared experience so we had lots to talk about there when we arrived at the resort there are a couple of other people that traveled independently because they were coming from different parts of the country so our challenge then was immediately bringing them into that group because the group had already kind of established. So it was a bit of a challenge because now all of a sudden there were some outsiders. And so we had to make sure they were brought in. And again, it was about st steering the conversations into what are the, the things that we have in common? How can we kind of share those? How can we get on the same page? And how can we start to ha have deeper conversations around that? And that then leads naturally into the work we start doing the next morning, obviously, where we get into some really deep conversations. Yeah, and Lynchpin Nation, what I want you to hear from what Jurgen just said was really how how he's taking on a leadership role of of 
like creating this community and, you know, setting the expectations for how to fit in and pulling people into the fold and asking the right questions, just making, you know, just noticing like who's, who's, who's uh, feeling like they're part of the fold, who isn't and really working to incorporate everyone. And I think uh, that that's on all of us as event leaders is to take that leadership role mm. uh, during our events and especially just plan to spend some time uh, at the beginning to, to really work on that. And you might even need to assign a team member or two or three to, to be helping with, with that. So um, great, love that. Um, love that you're doing it that way, Jurgen. And yeah. I'm guessing that everyone who comes just feels really like seen and heard at your events. Uh, and then also probably celebrated after you get them through the, uh, the planning piece and they, they present. So uh, you're talking all about these in-person events and <laughs> uh, we're just kind of living through this tiny little thing called a pandemic right now. Uh, what things have you been considering uh, as you get back into events after a pandemic a pause, as assuming that you perhaps took a little bit yeah. of one? Yes, we did definitely did take a pause. We had... Um planned an event for 2020 and at that the big event at the start of that year were some massive bushfires in Australia and that was um, the worst we've ever seen I think right across the board in Australia and we thought that was going to be the defining event of 2020 of course you know, we know now that that was a bit naive to think that <laughs> the um, what we decided at that time was that rather than go overseas, we would actually go to a regional Australian location. Of course, Australia, we're lucky here. The northern part of Australia is a tropical, um, a tropical environment. So we were looking at a couple of resorts there and we'd kind of gotten down to two and we're in negotiations for packages there when the pandemic broke out and all that uncertainty in the initial phase came about around travel and so on. So we put everything on hold. And of course, since then, we haven't done any more for in-person events. What, what we're looking at right now, I mean, it's still pretty uncertain from Australia to travel internationally. It's not that easy yet, although things are improving and, and starting to open up. So we're looking at possibly doing something in 2023, get my years right. Um, so we have had a high, we would have had a high hiatus of nearly four years by then. Um, in the meantime, I've been running some Zoom events with a difference where we bring people together just for an hour or an hour and a half and allow them to get together and start to have those meaningful conversations. So in a way, it's that model of that initial bring people together and get them to know one another at a little bit of a deeper level. And the way I do it is that at the end of that hour or hour and a half, people have permission and usually they want to continue that conversation with many of the people that they've met on the event. And that that's led to things like these podcast interviews, it's led to some joint venture initiatives that have gotten started, it's led to people doing business with one another because they found somebody that did what they need right then and there or they found somebody that knew somebody else who did what they needed right then and there or they found somebody that could connect them with someone that could help them get their product or service out into the marketplace and, and the word out more. So we've been doing that regularly as as a zoom event but as i say a zoom event with a difference i keep hearing these comments that i'm all zoomed out and um, part of that i think is that a lot of the events people just present so there's one maybe more people presenting it's a one-way street um, these events are very participative very active there's lots of music and dancing it's high energy um, so that's that's what we've been doing around the pandemic time to at least keep bringing people together and keep encouraging those meaningful conversations. 
And would you, because I agree, I hear that all the time, like, oh, everyone's all zoomed out. And I just think it's totally not true. It's, it's really more about the, the, the host than it is the, hmm. uh, the guest. Um, people are not all <laughs> tired of Zoom. Is there something that you think that you do better than, than others in terms of making those uh, Zoom events more engaging? Well, I think it's just getting people to participate. So it's not about me presenting something. Or, um, In fact, most of those events, I don't actually present anything other than talking about the logistics of the event. Here's how it's going to run. Here's what's going to happen. That's really all I present. And then the rest of it is all participation. So I just facilitate conversations between people, give them opportunities to um, mingle in small groups so that everybody has a chance to have a say and also have a chance to listen and focus on a few other people rather than a big group that that everybody might be there the total might be a big group but we break that up into smaller groups so everybody has that opportunity to really listen carefully and get to know some people at a deeper level and also to have their say and it's really great for introverts I think and the other thing is really just try to make it fun like I like to have fun on these events and I sort of do it in a way that hopefully everybody can have fun and I keep emphasizing this as a party and one of the challenges of course with these events is everybody's in different time zones so I start off by saying well some of you it's dinner time for some of you it's breakfast time for some of you it's lunch time for some of you it might be one o'clock so whatever it is that you need as food or beverage right now you're welcome to have that while we're having this um this event and it is a party so just enjoy so talk to talk to me more about how you make uh your in-person events fun what do you like to do well first of all that whole conversation we've had about the environment i think everybody's in a really good mood to start with and i think that's core to setting the scene and getting everybody in the right frame of mind. Then, of course, we, um, the food, we make sure that the food is first class and usually we come away from these things having put on um, a, a bit of weight unless somebody's d- disciplined enough to go to the gym in between time. Um, the, uh, usually it's at the water, so morning walks at the beach, Sometimes we have activities, if people have the energy to do activities after we've completed the day's event. Usually we try to wrap up the day's event by about three or four in the afternoon and then we'll sort of reconvene for dinner at 6.30 or so. In between that time, we've run little mini workshops. You know, I'm a keen photographer, so I've taken people out on the beach and said, hey, if you want to learn about some really just simple tips and tricks for taking photographs, things like photographing sunsets, which people find challenging, or things like, how do you make a photo stand out? Uh, uh, There's some beautiful scenery here. It's easy to take that photograph and people will say, that's beautiful scenery, but how do you make the photo stand out that it's actually different to just a standard postcard? And so we'll do little things like that. And we've had other people talk about, um, uh, what was, we've had some health, um, some physical health, or we've had some, we've done some um, hypnosis, just playing with hypnosis as as little mini workshops, just to kind of lighten the mood to have people enjoy themselves, but learn something from one of the people that has some particular expertise. Then we also schedule a full day where we do nothing in the middle. So usually the events go for six days. Um, and in, on the third day or the fourth day, depending on how the program pans out, we'll basically leave work completely and go and do something. So in Fiji, we went to a Fiji village. We walked to a waterfall, beautiful waterfall. We swam in the water there and under the waterfall, which was fun. We participated in a carver ceremony. So there's lots of fun stuff that, that we do. And again, it's as a group, we do this. And we had a tour guide and just having fun and, and relaxing and really enjoying ourselves. So when people come back 
after that day, there's um, almost renewed energy again. And also during that day, of course, there's lots of conversations happening about what's been going on in the last three days. And people reflect on their plans or reflect on the things that they've worked on up till then. And often on that day after that rest day, if you like, it's there's almost another transformation because there's been a lot of stuff happening unconsciously while people are distracted and and their minds on other things so in Vanuatu we went horse riding we went canoeing um, in Thailand I think we went uh, we took a boat off the island and went to a night market uh, nearby across on the mainland so yeah we always have that one day where and that's clear from the start but um, yeah the fun aspect is all throughout and having said that we're still challenging people uh, to be real we're challenging people to be honest so if somebody's trying to bs their way through an exercise or something we'll call them out on that Um, and even that we do in a fun way but it's clear that hey you're not getting away with this Hey, I don't want you to miss out. Did you know that this conversation always continues inside the Lynchpin Nation community? It's a free modern discussion forum exclusively for Green Room Central listeners that will have a profound impact on the way you look at events in your business. Get answers to your biggest questions, hear behind the scenes nuggets from event leaders, and get access to helpful templates, guides, and checklists as you start and scale events in your business. Be part of the daily discussion with entrepreneurs just like you. You can join for free over at greenroomcentral.com. I'll see you inside. That's important, too, to know that uh, that when a guest knows that uh, that they're they're being put, they, they signed up for a specific reason to get a certain transformation or kick off a certain transformation, if you will. And uh, I love that you're you're challenging them as the mm. leader in the room, and so that they they get every last ounce of what they came for out of it. You're not going to let anybody kind of uh, fall behind because they're not uh, challenging themselves sufficiently or thinking through a, a task in the right way. I've I've been in a room like that before, and you know it's it's almost like when you're um, you're you have like the, the hard teacher growing up <laughs> that you know just won't let you get away with stuff and it's going to make you push yourselves harder and in the moment you don't love it but then you know looking back years later you you really have such a sense of fondness and admiration and um just gratitude for being pushed and challenged to to reach your potential so i love that you're adding a little bit of that to your events yeah yeah, of course, we do it from a much kinder perspective in, in some sense than, than that strict teacher yeah. because we often, often I take the point of view of I've noticed that because it's something I do as well. And here's how I try to stop myself doing that and I'm calling you out on it now because I'm noticing that you're doing this now too. So in a way, it's a little bit kinder because it it gives people permission to accept that um, nobody's perfect, but at the same time to realize that, hey, we're doing something now that that actually gets in our own way. Well, you're helping them collapse time, right? That's why they're paying Mm. you to be there. And uh, so you're positioning your challenges in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, how do you feel after you get done with one of these events? In a way, it's um, it's a mixture of relief, exhaustion, and absolute elation. Um, the relief usually is, wow, you know, we've worked really hard to put this all together to get organised. There's been a lot of stuff that we've done in the lead up, um, and we've been on the go for six days now. So the relief is, wow, that that actually worked really well and, and it's done now. We can tick that off and and then we usually spend a couple of weeks just enjoying that and then we sit down and debrief and say, okay, what worked well? What can we do better next time? The exhaustion part is it is physically quite draining 
So often when when we get back, particularly if there's a long travel involved, I'll, I'll need two or three days just to recover. And the other thing is I'm actually an introvert. So to get out in front of people, to talk to people all the time, to uh, be the initiator of conversations takes a lot of energy. I have to put a lot of energy into doing that. And so once I switch that off, uh, I really notice it physically. So usually I have a few days where I have to um, sleep a lot or just relax. But the elation part is is the bit that really is the most exciting. I, I'm elated because of the transformations that I've observed, because of the possibilities that are coming out of that. And most of the time, two to three months later, I mean, at the three-month mark, we have a review with our participants. And at that mark, there's usually a whole lot of stuff already in place that's already happening, that's already changed the business, that's already grown their business, that's already moved them a big step towards the goals that they've set themselves. And even straight after the event, I can tell that those things are in place and the, the wheels are turning, the wheels are moving. It's going to be really hard to stop that actually happening if they do the work and, and I'm convinced they will. So that's the elation part. I sort of really feel elated at that. You know, I've, I've contributed to this transformation. They've done the work, but we've set the environment, we've provided the framework, we've kind of facilitated the, the whole process that got them there. Mm, so good. And I, I want to pause for a moment on uh, one thing you said about the exhaustion. Uh, so Lynchpin Nation, I want you to hear what he said. He takes like a few days to decompress and that is totally normal. And I think a lot of people don't put that time on their calendar. They just, uh, they just kind of plan to just go right back into daily life. And after putting on, uh, an event, you really do need time to decompress and recenter yourself. Uh, I think even if you're an extrovert, I don't think this is just for <laughs> introverts. Yeah. And I think you should have planned on your calendar two to four days uh, at least. You'll figure out what it is for you after you get into a rhythm of putting on your own events. But you're going to need that time. Uh, and I'll just say for myself, uh, it's... Uh, it's typically closer to the, uh, the, you know, like two, three, four, than you know, one, two. Um, and definitely for the first day after an event, I don't even move, uh, like off of a couch. And for anybody who knows me, uh, they, it's just absolutely like, they think something's wrong because I don't ever sit down. Like I'm always like busy with something. I remember after I, I had an event once and I was, it was in the town where I live, which is not normal. I usually do events that are away from where I live. And, and my parents lived close by at the time and they stopped by my house uh, the day after the event and the whole time, like from the moment they arrived, the whole conversation, they left. I like I was like draped over a chair and did not move. <laughs> and <laughs> I think everyone thought, uh, you know, like, um, I don't know, hell had frozen over. <laughs> <laughs> but it really Must is have been a bad event. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a good one. But yeah. uh, it's just a reality. And I think we should go in like eyes wide open mm. and have that time blocked on our calendars afterwards and not have expectations of yourself because it's a real thing to decompress from an event. And I appreciate that you uh, are taking that time. And also, I think the other important thing around that um, is to, in that decompression time, to reflect in what worked really well and, and rejoice in and celebrate the successes and what went well in the event before you get on to well gee that went wrong and this went wrong and next time I do this I have to fix that particular part of the system or fix this particular part that comes a little bit later allow time in that decompression and a little bit um, going beyond as I say we usually go for two weeks before we come back and and do a debrief on the event and in that time it's really about rejoicing in all the all the good things that happened all the transformations that happened all the fun we had 
everything that worked well. I love that rule that you have to celebrate the wins <laughs> in that first two week period. And then you're allowed to do the debrief with the what could what could be uh, done differently uh, next time. And mm. so you typically do that about two weeks out. Yeah, usually about that. And do you bring together and, kind of all of the any team that was involved and and do it as a as a group? Yeah, yeah, we do that as a team. The team that that mm -hmm. put it all together and the support team, and we also get feedback from all of the participants. So we get their feedback in terms of what worked well, what did they learn, and what would they like to see more of and different. And you bring the results of that survey to that meeting as like a discussion yeah. point. Yeah. Excellent. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of post-event surveys uh, of guests. And there's so much to learn there. And uh, glad, that, glad to hear that you're doing them too. So before we wrap up, I want to move into a little bit of a, a rapid fire segment, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> and <Sounds> fun. <laughs> I want to ask you a few questions and uh, see what, what's top of mind for you. So the first one I want to ask you is, what do you say to yourself backstage and on stage? <laughs> yeah, I heard you ask this question of a lot of other people, and it's um, it's interesting. I was having a conversation yesterday with a number of people that were just starting out um, in Toastmasters as speakers and talking about nerves and so on. Um, I'm not really sure what I say to myself before. I, what I normally do, and I do this when I start my podcast as well, is in the lead up to it, I really just focus on my mindset and bringing the mindset of I'm the servant here. I'm, I'm here to serve my audience. I'm here to serve my event participants. And I've got to bring my A game to this. The, the What's... You know what's best for me right now and it's got to be my a game it's got to serve the audience so anything that and i try to suppress anything i'm thinking about myself like the, my hair might be um, going a darker shade of gray than i would like or whatever it is because that's about me and the audience doesn't really care about that they're here to get value from whatever i've got to say or bring so i remind myself of that and take those deep breaths just before I go on stage to kind of just get settled. And I embrace the nerves because the moment I'm no longer nervous, it means I probably don't care anymore. So, and, and that was what I said to those people yesterday because they're all, oh, how do you, how, you're so confident on stage. How do you overcome the nerves? You know, how do you get rid of the nerves? And I said, well, I was nervous. But my nervousness is around caring about making the impact that I want to make. And so I embrace that because that's good. And so by doing that, it means it doesn't necessarily get in the way because I know it's there to hold me accountable. I know it's there to, um, to make sure that I'm bringing my A game, that I've got the energy and I've got the mindset and everything to bring my A game. Mm, so good. Uh, so you, my next question is, is about filling events. I'd love to hear your best tip for filling your events. Yeah. Our, our best process really is through networking, through word of mouth. They are boutique events, so we don't do a huge amount of advertising. Um, most of it is word of mouth from previous event participants that, um, recommend it to other people and say, hey, this was a fabulous event and we expect the next one will be fabulous as well. And then, of course, through our own networks where either we've done business with people at, in some other, um, some other service or product or they know of people that might be a good fit for us. And so we leverage that network to build that word of mouth marketing. Sure. Is there something specific that you say to past guests uh, as a way of asking them for referrals or to, to talk about it? Or does it just naturally happen? 
Yeah, we, we talk about it and encourage them right throughout the process um, of, well, first of all, we do a lot of video recordings and part of the, one of the video recordings we do during the event is if um, on the last day when we do video recordings of them presenting their pitches, um, whether that's to for their marketing program or for investors, and then we say, well, if anybody's up for it while we're doing that recording, um, if you could do a video testimonial for us and for this event, that would be wonderful. Most people are quite happy to do that as well. They're there in front of the camera already, so we just keep keep it rolling for that. Um, and then we encourage them, of course, to speak about their experience at the event with their colleagues, with their network, and, and just let them know that we're going to be doing it again in a year's time. COVID allowing, <laughs> Or so we thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that you do video testimonials during the event. That's so uh, wise and actually also really easy to do in a virtual setting too. Uh, so mm. I encourage that highly. What's what's your favorite event moment uh, at events that you host? Ooh, that's a tough question, that one, because there's, there's so many. Um, I think there are a couple of times where we've noticed somebody something going on with somebody and it's hard to figure out what is it that's going on with that person they've just what you observe is they've just kind of gone inside or withdrawn from an event or they haven't come out for a dinner or something and so you know is that maybe they're just tired and they need a rest or what's going on and on a couple of those occasions we've figured out that there was a deeper issue and were able to actually bring the person back into the fold in a way that made it okay for them to share that issue. And then with the group of people there, somebody, and usually together, we helped them solve that particular issue, whether it was um, they were missing their family at home. There, there might be instances, or well, there were instances like that, but we've then created a situation where they could talk with their family and they could actually tell them about some of the exciting stuff happening and that was okay. Whereas normally we, we're kind of saying, well, we're really cut off from the world here. We, the, the idea is to be really focused on ourselves and what we're doing with our business. Um, there's been other occasions where somebody didn't want to come on an excursion and we thought, well, they just didn't like what we had planned, which was... A surprise because we canvassed everybody up front and and then it turned out that um, they were balking at the cost of it because they wanted to spend that money on bringing home gifts for their family and so we said look we'll we'll pay for the excursion it's you know it's more important that we're all there and that those moments when people realize that they're being taken care of even when they're having a little crisis moment if you like they're still being taken care of and, and seeing them embrace that and know that they're really cared for that that's I guess that's a couple of the moments where I've really felt you know this is really touching ah oh, such and probably might, makes you feel like such like a good like important work that you're doing uh mm. and oh I love that um What's the best thing about hosting your own events that you've found since kind of adding them into your business? For me, the best thing is, I mean, it's, it's like we're presenting a service to the event participants. At the same time, we're also going through those exercises. And I find even when we're in presenter mode or we're in facilitator mode that I learn so much from each and every participant. I learned so much from going through the process. I learned so much about what's going on just by observing the whole environment, the interactions between people, the plans they have and how they go about realizing them and the, the shift in mindset, the shift in um, you know limiting beliefs just sort of falling away almost momentarily sometimes. Um, they're the, the things that I think are the best for me about the event, that there's so much that I learn 
uh, by running the event. Yeah, oh, I couldn't agree more. There's, it really isn't about uh, serving them. At some point, uh, you realize that it's it's so much for you. It's as much for you as it is it mm. is for them. I'd love to know what you're reading right now. Um, I've just finished an, a really interesting book uh, called Marketer in Chief by Jason Voyevich. And it talks about each of... So he's a, he's a marketer and he's also a hobby historian. So he's passionate about history and learning from the lessons of history. And what he's done in this book is presented each of the American presidents from George Washington right up to... to um, Oh, I've forgotten the name of the current the current guy. That's what he said about our prime minister, uh, Joe Biden. Really? He, okay. Uh, from from George Washington to Joe Biden, every single president, and he presented them in the light of what was the environment they were operating in, and how did they sell the narrative of what they wanted people to do, and he looked at it from the from sort of different eras as well. So in the early stages of the Republic, there were, they were essentially innovators. So he made that metaphor and, and lessons for modern marketers. So in the early stages, they were essentially innovators because they were inventing it. They were kind of flying by the seat of their pants. There was no rule book, really. They were developing the rule book. And then as that got established, then there was a period where um, folks were trying to figure out how do we operate this rule book, how do we operate these processes. And then, of course, there was the Civil War period and the disruption of um, people challenging whether the, those processes was right or whether some of the stuff that was still inherent in the whole system was right. And how did the presidents there sell the narrative to bring people on board, particularly where there was such uh, division within the country and then going forward and, and right up to the present day where you know, the challenges are now um, different than they were 100 years ago, the challenges of environmental um, change, the challenges of technology, you know, the, the technology revolution, the challenges of sort of in, in, in global arms race is still there. You know, that, that's probably been around for 50 years and how each of the presidents shaped the narrative as a marketing narrative to bring people on board. So I thought it was a really fascinating look at history and also with the lessons that he then drew parallels to how, how we could apply some of those things in marketing a business. That sounds super fascinating. I already mm. want to read it and I've already got somebody I want to uh, recommend it to. That sounds awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so what have you got going on right now that uh, we should know about and where can Lynchpin Nation find you? And definitely share your podcast too because yeah. uh, it's such a good one. Yeah, well, it's the Innova Buzz podcast and people can find that by going to either innovabuzz.com, that will take you straight to the podcast page or it is on our website, Biz dot com dot au and um, check out sarah's conversation with me on that podcast i can't remember the episode number now but it would have been in the high 400s so we've just recorded a bunch of panel conversations to celebrate our 500th episode and that'll be um that'll be out in march and one of the things that i'm really excited about this year is taking some of these online event type frameworks and also the the whole framework and process that we have for our podcast and using that to help people build content whether that's around podcasting whether that's promoting books whether that's putting together a series of um, courses all of those things we've got the frameworks that that are easily applied to that and i'm really excited to explore that and, and help people put together those assets for their business that will help promote their business that um, some people find quite challenging to, to build content 
as assets for the business and yet most people have everything they need up here inside their head or they've written a book or they've written blog posts and by having those conversations um, we can help draw that out and repurpose and produce a whole lot of additional assets that they didn't realize they actually had hidden somewhere inside their business or inside their head. Mm, so good. And where can we hear about that? Well, I've got a, a full, uh, I've published an audio course about our full podcasting process, and you can find that at innovabiz.co forward slash flywheel. Got it. So we call that our flywheel. And that's a full audio course of how we go about producing our podcast from launch to the 500th episode and beyond, as well as talking about how do we get guests on board, how do we promote the show, how do we ensure that there's an exceptional experience along the way for everyone. So that's all about the environment uh, that we talked about in the event and how do we generate referrals so that guests are always being sent our way. So good. Uh, I actually want to go listen to that myself. (laughs) (laughs) I will link all that up in the show notes. And huge congratulations to you on your 500th episode. After just being a few in myself, uh, it's it's easier now for me to appreciate what a huge accomplishment that is. So uh, just kudos uh, from me on that. Uh, Thank you, Jürgen, for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, thanks for having me on the show, and I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for listening to the Green Room Central podcast. If you loved this episode, then please take a screenshot on your phone and post it to Instagram, and be sure to tag at Sarah Faefer, and let me know why you liked it and what you'd like to hear or who you'd like to hear from in the future. That'll let me know what to create for you. If right now you're thinking, Sarah, yes, an event is happening. Most definitely. But here's the thing. I have a sizable team who can make this happen. But we need someone to teach us how. Well, then go to Green Room Central right now to book a private workshop. You'll get a customized two-day virtual workshop for your team. During the workshop, everyone will learn a repeatable framework, that can be used to start or scale events in your business. You'll then create a roadmap as a team so that everyone leaves the workshop with a shared vision for how to move forward with confidence. On average, I spend about an hour a day reading every month of every year. If you love learning on the go as much as I do, then I want you to go to greenroomcentral.com to get a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial of Audible, my audiobook platform of choice and a sponsor of Green Room Central. Please grab a copy of Marketer-in-Chief, How Each President Sold the American Idea by Jason Voyevich like like Jurgen did, or perhaps you want to grab a copy of How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, what's what's on my Audible bookshelf right now. I'm absolutely loving it. Uh, Perhaps give one of those a try. I appreciate your commitment to leveling up and learning the mindset and the strategies uh, of live events. And I want you to keep going. I want you to keep learning. If you want more, head over to greenroomcentral.com for show notes and all the links from today's episode.